been uh, a wonderful week. It's good to be with you this morning. God bless you, whether you're uh, here in person or online. It is good to be with you. Lenten peace to you. If you are visiting, um, and this is your first time or perhaps first time in a while, I remind you that you are loved, that you are welcome, that you are safe, and that God is well pleased with you. Let me begin with a story this morning, a personal story of a friend. Uh, I was part of this large uh, staff in Northern California near San Francisco, and I met a youth pastor there uh, that was really someone that we got along really well. There was a connection. We were both young at that time, uh, and we uh, both were pastors of color and doing good stuff, so we identified and connected. Uh, in fact, uh, we often would serve in each other's ministries and just be supportive to one another. The day I came and told the church after a long process of discernment that I felt called to plant a church and that when I was moving to Los Angeles, uh, uh, my friend, is my friend, uh, I mean, a youth pastor friend came and said, I totally support you. I'm so excited for you. And we have maintained that relationship. Once I left to Los Angeles to plant this new church, uh, not too uh, after, not too much time after that, I received news that he had uh, been diagnosed with cancer. And I'm not going to go into the specifics, but uh, it, I want you to understand this was a young uh, pastor, had three small children, was doing wonderful youth ministry, uh, was doing wonderful work for God, and then he receives this news. Uh, later on, uh, I had a chance to connect with him after uh, after he moved back or moved to Los Angeles to reconnect. And one of the things that he told me was that he was able to beat this cancer. But that this cancer uh, and beating this cancer uh, really gave him a second chance at life. And he was already doing good work, but now all of a sudden he felt that he was being called to do greater work. I was so moved by his devotion uh, to God, to service, to the people of God. Uh, today, he is healthy, strong. He is a fellow colleague, a senior pastor out in Orange County, doing wonderful ministry with his congregation. Uh, and, and you know what? Um, he's a diehard San Francisco Giants fan, and I'm a diehard Los Angeles Dodgers fan, so we shouldn't be friends. But we are, and we were able to overcome, right, our rivalry and realize that we have a common identity, that we work for the same God. See, I tell you that story this morning because today's wisdom is all about second chances. I titled today's sermon, This is for All the Survivors. You see, normally this text is avoided at all costs. It's way too thorny, shall we say, because sometimes we come out of this reading with more questions than answers. So let me get right into it. Luke's Gospel was especially written to a Gentile audience, a community, a non-Jewish community. Perhaps this is the reason why we hear all the dialogue about Galileans. Now, one must know, Jewish leaders, many of them, held great animosity towards Galileans. Many Jews viewed Galileans as second-class Jews, essentially not true Jews. They viewed them more like heathen Gentiles. And perhaps here lies the motive behind the questions and the, about, and all the, the, really the questions and the motives behind this whole Galilean tragedy that's being presented here. Because apparently Pilate, this brutal ruler, killed Galileans for political reasons. In the middle of their temple sacrifices, they were murdered. Are you hearing? And the Jewish community also held this common belief that uh, Gen that, that Galileans were not true Jews and somehow were less faithful. Or how about I put it this way? Somehow they were worse sinners than the Jews. Thus, their punishment was 
murderous tragedy. However, Jesus cleverly declutters, right, all these Jewish questions and motives and gets straight to the point, goes straight to the point. In fact, he brings it close to home. Uh, In fact, he speaks about another tragedy in Jerusalem when he says, what about those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were more guilty of wrongdoing than everyone else who lives in Jerusalem? Let me bring it even closer to us. Do we believe that those who perished in the tragedy of the Twin Towers were worse offenders than all others living in New York? How about this? Do we believe that those who have died in this global pandemic are worse sinners than us? Do people die because they are more sinful than others? I say to you, no exclamation point, because everyone sins. Everyone dies at some point. And see, the human desire to find a reason for suffering, for tragedy, often leads us to more questions than answers. Still, I wonder, what did Jesus mean by saying to the Jews, change your hearts and lives? Perhaps the Jews were asking the wrong questions. Perhaps the better question to ask in view of tragedy, in view of innocent death, is how should Tragedy changed the way we live. To this, Jesus gives an illustration through a parable. You read it, you heard it, of a man who had a fruitless fig tree in his vineyard and after three years wanted to cut it down because it's not producing, it's not giving fruit. Yet his gardener persuades him to give the tree one more year. The gardener commits to digging around the tree, to care for the tree, commits to giving it fertilizer, to tend after it. And here is where I want to invite you this morning to open your heart, your mind, and your soul. Here is where we invite the holy ancient wisdom to enter the room. Here is where we invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to show us to uh, lead us, to guide us. This is the moment to be fully present. You see, today's wisdom is for all the survivors. For all those Galileans who survived Pilate's killings. For all the Jews who survived the falling tower in Jerusalem. For all those New Yorkers who survived the falling of the Twin Towers in New York City. And for all of those who survived this global pandemic. As survivors, we are living only by the grace of God. And therefore, our lives must mean something. We must bear fruit. You see, it's been said that the whole process of evolution in this world is to produce useful things. You see, the question we must all wrestle with is, of what use were we to this world? Because it is evident there are two kinds of people in the world, those who take out more than they put in and those who put in more than they take out. And we know this much, uselessness invites disaster. What kind of person will you be Because there is a responsibility for humanity, upon humanity, to pass this world to the next generation better than how we found it. And this is precisely where I want to pause. Because the lesson of the fig tree calls us to lament. You see, it calls us to lament the systemic injustices of our world. My mentor Uh, And Professor Dr. Su Chen Ra describes lament as the appropriate ecclesial, liturgical, and personal response to the reality of pain and suffering in our world. But see, this lesson, it also calls us to repentance. It calls us to repent of our complicity, of our culpability. Have we even considered that 
our apparent advantages, our apparent privileges, our comfortable homes, substantial incomes, all kinds of foods that we get to eat, safe from war, that all of those privileges are also a warning? How are we bearing fruit with all of those advantages? And see, this question is not just for Christians. This question is for the churches. It's for the denominations with all this accumulated wealth, these grand cathedral uh, uh, architectures, this, these tall steeples, these large staffs, professional choirs. Uh, have they not considered that all that abundance has been given to them in effort to lead them to bear fruit, to share their resources, to share of themselves? They are survivors, too. Not because of their massive budgets, not because of their beautiful music or well-prepared sermons, certainly not because of their beautiful buildings or sophisticated theologies, but only by the grace of God, who has decided to give them a second chance. And see, here's the issue this morning. Many do not acknowledge their second chance. Many do not lament the systemic injustices of our world. Many do not repent from their complicity and culpability. In fact, many believe there is no need to lament. Many believe there is no need to admit complicity or culpability about things that happened hundreds of years ago. But see, the most fascinating part about all this this morning for me, that as Bible-reading Christians, it should not be any threat to admit wrong. Repentance is, is rudimentary, right? To following Jesus. The, the language of the scriptures are all about repentance and forgiveness. It is biblical to repent of our idolatry. It is uh, biblical to remove the false images and idols that are created, to remove individualistic arrogance, to remove nationalistic pride, to repent from our American exceptionalism and triumphalism. And it is not exceptional, it is not triumphant to build a country on the backs of free slave labor and free stolen lands of indigenous peoples. Our American history is not so exceptional. In fact, our present day is not so exceptional either. I mean, just look back uh, from outside and inside the American Christian Church, how the response was against the Black Lives Matter movement. Racism, white supremacy, all lives matter slogans are the responses to such a movement. However, not once in history have we ever said that all lives do not matter. What has been perpetuated for hundreds of years, by the way, is that black lives do not matter. On top of that, that red lives do not matter and brown lives do not matter. And as Christians, when we say black lives matter, it is not a personal preference. It is what the Bible says. It is what the Word of God says. It is a true biblical reality that rejects the unbiblical statement that every black and brown and indigenous body is made in the image of the triune God. You see, this morning, as a person of color, I do lament, okay, that the reality is that my people, the BIPOC communities, the API communities, that they feel disengaged from the American Christian Church. I lament the sins of racism, of white supremacy, of ethnic cleansing, of nationalism. I lament for my siblings of the queer community, uh, the sins of homophobia and transphobia and discrimination that have created barriers between them and the church. I lament that our young people, our college students, are missing from the church because of sins of preference, power, and individualism, rejecting this new generation from uprising within the church. There is so much to lament. There is so much to repent. And this lesson is so appropriate for this Lenten season because some of us have experienced the world like a fig tree in the middle of a large, great vineyard. Because after all, what is a fig tree doing in the middle of a vineyard? Alone and yet expected to thrive in a field not made for it, not made for you. You see, part of a society that consistently doubts you, others you, threatens you to be cut down if you do not produce. But see, here lies the hope for us this morning. 
here lies the hope for us this morning. What the world expects from us is not what Jesus expects from you. Jesus, the gardener, gives us one more year, gives us a second chance. This is the nature of Jesus, to give us second chances. He did, after all, die on a cross to give us an infinity of second chances, to take away our shame, failures, mistakes, our sins, our pride, our unwillingness to lament, our unwillingness to repent, gives us his forgiveness, his successes, his righteousness, and his grace, and rose from the grave on the third day to give us liberation and freedom. Freedom for what? You see, it is liberating to know that Jesus commits to digging around us, fertilizing us, tending to us, nurturing us with mercy, forgiveness, and grace. It is freeing to know that we are treated with boundless mercy and justice. And while this world wants to blame us, seeks to measure our worthiness by our output, success, status, ethnicity, color of our skin, gender identity, that all that Jesus wants to do is to remind us of our roots in the triune God, living in their image. Always nourished, always loved, always ready to bloom, ready to flourish, freely able to share our gifts with the world. You see, this story is a story of grace. God's grace allows us to live on. God's grace allows us to bear fruit. But see, what shall we do with such infinite grace, with such infinite forgiveness? What shall we do as the survivors? You see, perhaps we can be like our gardener, and we too can see others with grace. We too can give others another year to bear fruit. We too can see God in their eyes and on their faces, and we can see the potential and the hope in them. See, God's grace should move us. It should move us. It should stir us. It should awaken us to change our hearts and to change our to respond with an elevated, ethical response to all creation, to care for the poor, to share of our resources, to give of our time and advocacy, to care for the aina, for the land, to generously throw ourselves into that which is bigger than us, to participate in the flow, in the dance, in the mission of God that is healing and reconciling all of creation. To live like that is to live to the full, to the brim, to be in fruitful living. Your fruits will come. It will be expansive. It will be broad. It will be inclusive. It will be far, far, far reaching. You know, I, I want to end this morning with some lyrics from a song from the early 2000s titled Survivor from the women of Destiny's Child. A shout out to an amazing and gifted woman, Beyonce, right? As part of that group. And I just feel these words speak the truth of a survivor. Wishing you the best. Pray that you are blessed. Much success, no stress, and lots of happiness. I bet it I'm not going to blast you on the radio. I'm better than that. I'm not going to lie on you or your family. I'm better than that. I'm not going to hate on you in the magazines. I'm better than that. I'm not going to compromise my Christianity. I'm better than that. You know I'm not going to diss you on the internet. Because my mama taught me better than that. I'm a survivor. I'm not going to give up. 
not going to stop. We're going to work hard. I'm a survivor. I'm going to make it. I will survive. I'll survive. This survey is for all of us, of course. How will you live your life? Word of God and Word of Life, we all say together, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me this morning?